Good morning, Temple. Come on, one more time. Good morning, Temple. Yes. I invite you to stand as you're able. We're going to praise our God this morning. Temple, you may be seated. My name's Kurt. I'm part of the team here, and we're so glad that you've decided to come and worship with us today. Is everyone having a good morning? Is it good? How's the weather outside? Nah, it's not cold. It's just like yuck, like, like Seattle, Washington, and who would ever want to live there for a lot of reasons? But we're glad you're here. Hey, if this is one of the first times you've ever been to the temple and you have questions about anything you see or hear or just want to know how to get plugged in, um, fill out the connect card at the bottom of this bulletin you should have received when you came in. If you didn't get one when you came in, they're sitting out there on a little stand and you can grab one. 
and just fill out that card and drop it in the offering buckets or hand it to me and uh, I'll get back with you tomorrow and answer any questions you might have. In fact, it's pretty important that everyone here get a Connect card today because the, we're in a series called Toolbox and this toolbox behind me, we're going to give away when this series is over for free. And the way you enter to get it is you fill out a Connect card and there's a basket on a white table in the lobby, you drop it in there, one per household. You can put one in this week and next week. And then when the series is over, we're gonna do a drawing and give this toolbox away. And I think it would look great like in a kitchen or a master bedroom, wherever you wanna put it, um, you'd have a toolbox. So make sure you do that. Um, there are Bibles for sale in our bookstore. They're the English Standard Version. If you don't have a Bible that's easy to read and easy to understand for you, we've bought a bunch of them to sell. And uh, normally, because we're paying about $20 a piece for them, and that's what we were selling them for, but a couple of families in our church have stepped up and said, hey, sell them for $10 a piece, and we'll cover the leftover um, of all that. So you can get a great Bible for $10 in our bookstore right now if you don't have one that's easy to read and understand. A few weeks ago, past, or a couple weeks ago, Last week, Pastor Phil talked about the Bible being one of the most important tools that's in our toolbox. And so we're really working in 2021 to get Bibles into people's hands that's easy to read and easy to understand. So we're glad you're here. If you want to give your tithes and offerings, you can drop them in the buckets on your way out the doors um, at the end of the service. And uh, that's it for announcements. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll continue in worship. God, this morning, we're so thankful for who you are. And God, this morning, my prayer is that you will, you will overwhelm us with your presence. God, I pray for the people that are, that are here, for the people that are watching online, for those who couldn't make it today, God, I pray that as we come before you, we take an hour out of our week right now to focus on you, to go to church, as they say. But God, while we're at church today, pray that your presence will overwhelm us, that your kindness will overwhelm us. God, as the psalmist said, when he wrote, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not you being angry at us or punishing us or causing bad things to happen to us that causes us to repent, but it's when your kindness overwhelms us that we repent. So God, I pray for those sitting here. I feel in my spirit this morning that there's people who need to be overwhelmed by your kindness. They need to hear you say to them, it is okay and everything's going to be all right. I love you. I love you in spite of and I love you anyway. God, for those watching from home and our family members that may be home because they couldn't make it, God, overwhelm them with your kindness today. You're such a good, good father. And you love us so much. And God, sometimes we don't sense it and we don't feel it. We know that's on our end because we're not connected. So God, this morning come in like a wrecking ball and overwhelm us with your kindness. You're invited in this place. You're invited into our hearts. You're invited into our lives. God, most importantly, thank you for Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross that opened the door for our redemption so we can have a relationship with our creator. God, we love you this morning. Hear our worship. Help us worship you and bless you and bring you glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, I invite everybody online and everybody in this room. Let's stand up together and we're going to sing about God's grace.
on, sing out. Jesus, our redemption, right here. Jesus, come on. Our redemption. Come on, declare it. Our salvation is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven. Jesus.
the fullness of who you are. Lord, I'm ready. I just want more. I just want more. More of you, God. More of you, God. I just want more. I just want more. More. Making room for you, Lord, I'm ready to open up my heart to receive not in part, but the fullness of who you are, Lord, I'm ready, I just want more, I just want more, more. One touch from your robe steals the weakness from my bones. Oh, I need more of you. Oh, come and reach into my heart. Come and heal every part, Lord. I want more of you. Oh, it just Just one touch from your robe stills the weakness from my bones. Oh, I need more of you, and I just want more of you. Can the church say amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that you're in this place. We thank you that your presence is here. Lord, you said where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am with them, and you are here today, Lord God. We thank you so much for your presence. Lord, change lives, change hearts, change families, change destinies, eternal destinies. Lord God, in this moment, I pray that you would change us. We open ourselves to you to hear your word and to experience you today. And we give thanks to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Now, before you sit down, 
Turn to somebody and just kind of give them a casual, how you doing wave, okay? Just kind of a casual, how you doing? Now turn to somebody else and say, I'm glad you got to come to church with me today. There you go. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I invite you to turn to the book of Nehemiah. That's where we're going to be uh, camping out here today. And, and uh, I hope that uh, you'll find that. Um, it's actually in the Old Testament. Uh, good luck. Uh, no, it's, it's there. I promise it's there. Uh, we've been in a series called Toolbox where we're talking about uh, the different tools that we're going to need to conquer in 2021. And we've been looking at the book of Nehemiah as kind of our framework to guide us through that and rebuilding and building our life in this new year. And uh, just to kind of recap, for those of you who may not uh, remember or those who may not have been here during this time, uh, Nehemiah is a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes in the Persian Empire. And he's got a sweet gig. His whole job is to basically drink what the king drinks to make sure that it's not poison. And as I said last week, it's really good until it's not really good. And, and it, and it, but it's a great gig. And he finds out that his ancestral home, Jerusalem, where his family's from, he's not really from there because he's never really been there. But his ancestral home, Jerusalem, the, the city of God has been destroyed. It lays in ruins. And it... The, the wall that is around it has been torn down, it's been destroyed, gates have been burned with fire. And as I said before, gates and walls meant strength. Gates and walls meant hope. You cannot build a future without hope and without strength. And so Nehemiah, it cuts him to the heart. And even though he doesn't have to do it, he decides, I'm leaving the palace, I'm leaving the plush life behind, I'm leaving the, the cupbearer job, and I'm going to go and I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to go and I'm going to stay there, and I'm going to build and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem back to where it was. Now I want you to turn to Nehemiah chapter 3, if you brought your Bibles, and if you didn't, um, we're going to show it on the screen, but I'm going to take a few moments here, and I want you to just kind of read down through chapter 3, it's going to be on the screen. And we're going to have this wonderfully awkward silence here for a few minutes that we all absolutely love, okay? And so I just want you, we're not going to read it because it's stinking long, okay? And there's lots of names in it. But I want you to see what stands out to you in the scripture, in this chapter. We'll read it, we'll just skim over it real quick, okay? Begin awkward silence. If you're watching from home, don't adjust your volume. It's all good. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. All right, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Now let me ask you a quick question. In the verses that you kind of skim through, what stands out to you? you? You can talk in church. What stands out to you? What's that? You can't say any of the names, right? What else? Everybody's building. What else? Huh? Oh, prepared. Okay. What else? Repairs. All repairs. Okay. 
Uh, in the first service, somebody said Dungate. That's what stood out to them. <laughs> Poor Malkijah, he had to deal with the Dungate, which, by the way, that's exactly what it is, okay? That's exactly what it was for. Uh, yeah, the two things that you notice here, you see all these different things that we notice, but the two things that particularly stand out are names and places. Names and places. There are 38 names in Nehemiah chapter 3. And it's a record of the people, of what they did and where they did it in rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem. It's not a list. It's way more than a list. Like you wouldn't go, I mean, a list is what you take to the grocery store. You wouldn't, you wouldn't go to the Vietnam uh, War Memorial and say, um, yeah, this is just a list of names, would you? No, absolutely not. It's more than just a list of names. It, it's more than that. Here's what Nehemiah chapter 3 is. It is... Nehemiah's community it's Nehemiah's community it's the people in whom Nehemiah has invested his life it's the people that have invested their life into Nehemiah it's the people that have loved God love each other and they've realized a very vital principle and that's this that you can't do life alone you say that with me you can't do life alone. They've realized that. Friends, if we're going to conquer in 2021, we have to realize this basic principle that you can't do life alone. And that's why the next tool that we're talking about today is community. Community. Now, when I say community, I'm not talking about Port Natchez. I'm not talking about Groves or Nederland or whatever. Community in, in the Bible is, is defined as this. Community is an intentional relationship in which we walk alongside others in order to encourage, equip, and challenge one another in love to grow toward maturity. Maturity, I've learned to say that. I used to say maturity, and you all got on to me and said, that's wrong, and so I now say maturity. My mother would just be rolling over in her grave because she always, it was literature to her, ma mature. But anyway, I, I digress. Uh, it's <clears throat> in maturity, maturity in Christ. Yeah, I said it. See, community isn't about a curriculum. It's not about a program. Community is relational. Community is personal. Community is doing life together. And here's the thing. If we're going to conquer which is the, the verse, Romans 8, 37, which is the verse that we're using. That's the, our scripture verse for this year as a church. That, and yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who has loved us. That's our verse for the year. If we're going to conquer, we need to grow in maturity in Christ Jesus. And you do not grow in maturity in isolation. You grow in maturity in community. That's what community is for. In fact, that's the way God designed it. God designed us to be interdependent, not independent. God designed us for each other. God designed certain things that we were called to do and be, and that they, we're only able to be and do those things together as we grow and learn uh, from each other. And so maturity is something, friends, if we're going to move on in 2021, build our life together, we've got to do it together got to do it together let me let me give you an illustration of the importance of of ma maturity um imagine if you went into one of the preschool rooms uh before the worship service you might see a little boy uh, uh you know sitting down on the rug taking a little toy car going vroom 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 right you might see a little girl off to the side she's got a doll and she's talking to the doll and she's singing to the doll you may see a little boy in the corner crying just crying his eyes out just bawling his eyes out you wouldn't really think anything of it, would you? No, because they're preschoolers, they're four-year-olds. This is what they do, okay, most of the time. But what if you changed that location to in here? And, and you walked in and you saw me up here on the stage with a toy car making vroom, vroom, vroom sounds, right? What if Dana was up here with a doll, talking to the doll, singing to the doll? What if Kurt was over in the corner crying? Actually, that's not a good idea, because... Actually, it sounds like Kurt. Actually, he does that a lot. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a weekly ritual, actually, him in the court of crime. But bad example. But anyway, uh, if you saw that, you'd go, something's not right here. Something, somebody missed 
maturing. And that's why it's so important. If we're going to conquer, if we're going to be the church that builds and we build our life together, we need to grow in maturity. And maturity doesn't happen alone. It happens, friends, in community. It happens in community. And so in order to use this tool of community, we need to really do two things. And they're not necessarily... um, They're not necessarily, they don't build on each other. They're two independent things that you can begin. And the first is get grounded. Everybody say get grounded. grounded. You know, in electricity, there is an outlet called a grounded outlet. And it has uh, three slots to it. And what it means is, is that the, there's a wire that goes directly into the ground to absorb the excess electricity. And so if there, a surge happens, a surge of electricity happens, it allows that electricity to be pushed through that ground wire so that the earth absorbs the surge, right? Here's the thing. Every single one of us go through surges in life. Life is all about surges. I mean, and, and surges are not planned. Surges are not predicted. Surges, you, you, you don't, they just come upon you. If you're, if you're on the lake and a surge happens, it happens all of a sudden, doesn't it? If you're on the Sabine, surges happen a lot sometimes. And surges can happen in your life. You can just be plugging along, going along in life, and all of a sudden, you know, bam, you get fired from your job. Bam, you go through a financial crisis. Bam, your your kid gets in trouble. Bam, you know, your wife gets sick. Bam, your grandpa dies. Bam, your favorite basketball team has the worst record since 1926. (laughs) But they did beat LSU. Mm, That says more about LSU than it does about the Kentucky Wildcats, I'm afraid. But anyway, and okay, I know that's more, I know Grant's dying is more important, but you get my idea, okay. And, and, and see, all of us, friends, that we all are going to go through surges in life. It is absolutely inevitable. In fact, life happens in, in surges. And one of the things that I know as a pastor, over 20 years now, probably 25 years, the difference maker with those people who survive through the surges and those who don't is if they're connected, grounded in community in church. It is the difference maker. And so my my question for you is is really simple. Are you grounded here at the temple? Or are you just kind of floating? Are you living kind of ungrounded? Have have you put your wire, if you will, in the ground? You'll never rebuild in 2021 with an ungrounded life. You just won't. Because when the surges come, and they will come, it's inevitable, you'll get shocked. And see, Nehemiah realized this. Nehemiah realizes that he has to be grounded. He has to ground himself in Jerusalem. Because he's living off in another place. He's living off in the, in the palace. And, and when he decides to come to Jerusalem, in Nehemiah chapter 2, uh, verse 8, it says that the, he asked the king. He said, he said king, can I, can I get some of your timber from the royal forest to build a house? And he says, for the residents... I will occupy. Everybody say residence. Residence, yeah. You know, when I was in college, it was kind of the beginning of the uh, political correctness movement when, you know, they would change the name of a lot of things and you weren't allowed to say certain things, you know, on campus and that kind of stuff. And when, when I got there as a freshman, there were these, um, like, I don't know, they might be juniors, maybe seniors. They were, they were student guides, and they would kind of guide you to your class or guide you to where you were living and that sort of thing. And you, it, was, it was a great thing to have, you know, when you first showed up on campus. Like, you know, where, can I, where do I go eat? That was my number one question. And, and so I show up with, you know, my bags, and, and this guy is there, and he's this student guy. And he, I, have you all ever seen the movie uh, Couples Retreat? Anybody in here? Godless people. Okay, yeah, if you've seen the movie Couples Retreat, uh, you you remember Stanley with a C? Yeah, okay, Stanley. Well, this guy kind of resembled Stanley with a C, and he kind of acted like Stanley with a C, because I I went up, and I got my bags, and I'm like, hey, man, um, can you show me where my dorm is? And he goes, we don't have dormitories here at Berea. We have residence halls. And I'm like, what's the difference between a residence hall and a dorm? He goes, oh, there's a big difference. Well, a dorm is where you sleep, but a residence hall is where you live. 
I'm like, okay, can you point me to where I'm going to live? You know, it's a, there's a difference, right? Because just sleeping somewhere is one thing, but taking up residence is something entirely different. And Nehemiah is set, going into Jerusalem. He's saying, look, I'm not just going to go and find somewhere to sleep. I'm going to find somewhere where I am going to live, where I am going to reside. And he asks the king, he says, I need to build a house for me so that I can live in that house. And then in verse 18, he, it, it goes on, verse 17, it goes on. He's talking to the elders about the problem that, with the walls and everything. And he says to the elders of Jerusalem, he said, you see the trouble we are in? Let us rebuild the walls so we will no longer be a disgrace. Did you notice the word we there? Did you notice the word us there? Nehemiah is not from Jerusalem. As far as we know, he's really never been to Jerusalem until now. But all of a sudden, Nehemiah is saying, listen, I'm going to get grounded. I'm going to ground myself here. I'm going to put my wire in the ground. And I'm, it's not about you and me. It's not about them and, and, and me. It, it's about us. It's about we. I'm going to ground myself here in Jerusalem. So how do, how do you get grounded here at the temple? I'm glad you asked. Uh, step one is just keep showing up. You know, the, you know, somebody said that half the battle in life is actually just showing up. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Just keep showing up. Make it, make it your, your intention. Make it your goal that no matter what happens, I mean, as much as you absolutely possibly can to be here on a Sunday morning or to watch or whatever you're doing. Because you want to make sure that, that showing up is, is a big deal. Because you grow when you show up. You get connected when you show up. You get grounded when you show up. And, and, and as you keep showing up, also, you know, one thing is to accept Christ as your Savior. You say, well, wait a minute, that, that's, isn't that obvious I'm here at the church? But, you know, Kurt said a few weeks ago, he said that uh, just because you stand in your garage doesn't make you a car. And just because you're in church doesn't mean you're necessarily a Christian. I've been a pastor long enough to know that there's a lot of people who are in churches who've never crossed the line of faith. And, and God loves you. And he is offering his grace to you. And he's just waiting for you to say yes to his invitation of forgiveness, of grace, of a second chance. He's just waiting for you. He's got a life for you. He, he wants your life to be influenced by him and directed by him. And he has a new life for you. But a lot of times we sit and we've been in church, but we've never, ever said really yes. Say yes to him. Another, another way to get grounded is to get baptized. But, you know, getting baptized really is about going public with your faith. And a lot of us may be like, you know, I've been in the church, but I'm afraid to say that I haven't really been baptized. Hey, it's okay. It's really okay to say, you know what, I, or I don't remember getting baptized. I'd like to remember my baptism. Hey, you know what, that's great. I've done that for people. I've helped people. It's one of those things that it's saying, you know what, I, when I was a baby, yeah, I, mean, I know God was working in me as a child growing up, and I know his grace was with me, and I, I know that it, he was there, and I was, grew up in a Christian way, but now my walk with God is so different, and I, I want to I I do something that symbolizes the difference in my walk. Hey, if, if you've never been baptized, we will baptize you. Go public with your faith. Go public and say, you know what, I'm not ashamed of what God's done in my life. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, of the grace of Jesus Christ. If you've already been baptized, we'll, we'll do a, a little ceremony called Remembrance of Your Baptism where we, where we mark that God is doing a, a great work in your life. Another thing that you can do to get grounded is to become a member. And on February 21st, we're going to have a Discover the Temple class. It lasts basically an hour. And it's an opportunity to discover what we believe and why here at the temple. And it's a way to, to actually become a member of the temple. And uh, we actually feed you, which is pretty stinking awesome. So, um, you know, and, 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 and so mark that. You'll have details coming. But mark that. That's a way to get grounded here at the temple. And as we're grounded, the other way to get connected and use this tool in community is to get connected. Everybody say get connected. Now, to get connected, honestly, um, you may be like, wait a minute, I thought I got connected. No, you got grounded, but now it's time to get plugged in. 
And, for, and honestly, those two aren't necessarily built on each other. Like some people decide to join a, a class or join a small group long before they ever uh, join in membership. That's okay. That's perfectly fine. But, so these don't necessarily build on each other. But I encourage you to get connected. Let me, let me give you an illustration of what it means uh, to be connected. Um, when you're, this, this drill is here. It's shown up. But there's a problem with it, and that's it's not connected. And, and it, it, once it's charged up and everything's going great with it, it'll go fast, it will really go strong, you know, it, it'll really do the job. But over time, it starts to lose its charge, doesn't it? Over time, it gets weaker and weaker until it begins to, to slow down. And you know that, that, that sound of slowly dying on a drill, it's like, and you're like, oh no, and you got to go plug it in. And that's like us, friends. That, there's, a, there's a connection with us. Because we can be here on Sunday morning but never ever get connected. And you can start off really fast and really strong in your faith and really be going. But over time, if we don't get connected, we begin to get slow in our faith. Our faith slows down. And we become less and less effective to what God wants us to do uh, in our life. And so I, I encourage you to get connected because honestly the greatest growth that you have does not happen in this room the greatest growth that you experience happens in a class it happens around small groups it happens around somebody's living room where you you get to know each other and you learn something about each other see that's one of the benefits of groups is that you really do learn about people and you learn from people I was in a, a small group years ago when I was single and it was a guy small group that a buddy of mine invited me to and uh, he's like, man, you got to come. This is a great group of guys. It's great, great, great. And I'm like, that's great. So I go in, and I'm sitting there, and this one guy is like Adonis looking. He's like, you know, he's really good looking guy. He's really in shape, you know. He, you can tell he's working out, you know, at, in, in, you know in his sleep. You know, he's, he's that kind of guy, you know. And, and he's always eating healthy. He's always, and I always hated it when it was his turn to bring snacks to the small group because he always brought the healthy stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Like the kale chips and the edamame and the chickpeas and the cottage cheese with flax seed, you know. I'm over there with a thing of Little Debbie zebra cakes, okay? And I'm trying to convince him. I'm like, this is a meal replacement, you know. One of these is 270 calories, you know. Yeah, it's not working, yeah. And, and, and I'm looking at the guy and I'm like, you know what, you look really, really familiar. And he goes, yeah, I'm your dentist. And I'm like, oh. And he, goes, he does this. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah. You look. He said, you would know that if you had regular appointments. And I'm like, well, I got the zebra cake, so I'm working on an appointment right here. Right? And I got, so I got to meet my dentist. I got to know this guy. And it was a really great guy. There was another guy who was a Navy SEAL. I mean, he was, he was one of those guys that he would do triathlons on a whim he just wake up in the morning what am I gonna do today I think I'm gonna do a triathlon he, he was a whimsical triathlete that's what he was okay another friend of mine my, my friend who invited me was a marine he was on the first tank over in Iraq and he was this v-shaped specimen you know another guy was this big huge hulking guy who you know muscles I mean just big old honking guy looks like he lived in the gym he actually owned the gym and so I'm sitting around a table with these guys Right? And I'm thinking, one of these things doesn't belong here, right? Like, I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt, and he's like, they're like, it's, it's hot outside. Why are you wearing a long sleeve shirt? And I'm like, have you seen my biceps? And they're like, no. I'm like, neither have I. So that's why I'm here. Yeah. And so, he, and so, so, but you know what was crazy? Is even how diverse this was. I mean, they didn't judge me. I mean, I, they probably did. But, it, but I didn't, they didn't, at least they didn't say it. And, and uh, but the thing was, is as diverse as this group was, and and, and, and different as I was, I learned so much from those guys. There were some things that they really made me aware of, and there were some things, the changes that I wanted to make in my life because of them. And that's what it does for us spiritually. When we get in a group, we begin to learn from each other. We begin to grow from each other. We learn, begin to learn about each other. You know, C.S. Lewis said that, that one of the things about connection and Christian connection is that it's, it's one person looking at another person and saying, you too? I thought I was the only one. There's a power in that, isn't there? When somebody else has been through what you've been through or is going through, 
or what you're going through makes a difference one of the powerful things about nehemiah chapter 3 is if you go down and you take a look at all of the the diversity of the people there i mean you got people who are working the dung gate right and you got guys that are the nobles you've got guys that are perfume makers you've got guys that are jewelers you've got guys that are goldsmiths you've got some guys that have got a, they've got their daughters working for them out there on the gate uh, all kinds of things you have a diversity of people and they're all connected in, into community they're all connected they're all learning from each other because they realize this fundamental truth that if we're going to rebuild our life we've got to do it together we've got to do it together and one, one another benefit of, of getting connected is that we grow farther together than we do apart and, and we know that you know at the beginning god said that we need each other when god created the first man when he created adam he looked in, in genesis 2 18 he says it's not good for man to be alone and honestly throughout the scriptures we often think of these great biblical characters as being like individuals and it's just them. But, but they have an, an entire community that they were connected to. Abraham had an entire group of people who were with him. Moses, we think of Moses being one guy, but Aaron and her and uh, Miriam and Joshua were a part of his connection. Joshua had his generals. That was his group of guys that, that got connected. And, uh, King David had his mighty men who were basically like his small group. Within the, in the new, and even in the New Testament, with, with Paul, Paul was not just one single guy. Paul had Silas, he had Barnabas, he had John Mark, he had Timothy. He had all those guys that he connected with. Even Jesus was connected in community in a small group. He had 12, 12 guys that he was connected to. And you know, to me, that just, just knowing that Jesus gathered 12 guys to be connected to overcomes all of the resistance that any of us would have to getting connected in community because if Jesus the son of God who is perfect in absolutely every way needed to be connected to other people uh so do we right amen so do we if he needed to be connected we needed to be connected as well you know the, the other day i was uh, taking our little dog uh that we call zoe baby we nicknamed her baby girl because she's always my baby girl and we t i took her out to do her business and everything and i'm outside and i look up and these geese are flying over and they are booking it they are absolutely flying so fast and i i began to read up on geese and found out that they fly together and when they do they fly 72 percent farther than they do by themselves who put that in them God put that in them. And God looks at some of us trying to carry the box of our life, the load, bearing this load that we've got, struggling with our back, struggling with our legs, strugg our arms straining, and God's saying, why are you doing this alone? It's not good. It's not good. That's why he's created community for us. In Nehemiah 4, 17 and 18, it says something kind of interesting. It says that, they work next to each other and alongside each other. Actually, it says it over 20 different times in Nehemiah that they work next to each other and they work alongside each other. They work together. And one of the interesting things that it says is that when they built the wall, they used one hand to build the wall and the other hand they held a weapon. Why did they do that? Because they realized what was at stake and so they knew they had to stay connected to one another. See, one of the benefits of community, being in connection, is that, that we often don't really see, we don't really get, is that there are strength in numbers. And, and we don't see it because I think we're kind of insulated from the world sometimes, that we don't realize that we are in a battle. We're in a battle. The Satan wants to sift your family like we that he wants to destroy your marriage. He wants social media to raise your kids. He wants your values to be the same values as the culture and for you to never, ever question it whatsoever. He wants that. And see, when we're connected to one another, 
and we're connected to the people who are following God and serving God and seeking God, God can do incredible things in us and through our families. God can do impossible things in us and through our families. But when we are isolated, when we're on our own, we're, Satan is just licking his chops just like a wolf does when the sheep is away from the fold because he knows it's about time to strike. You know, the statistics show us over and over and over again that when, we're conne- when someone is connected, that we live longer, that our physical health is better, that our mental health is better. And you know, the exact opposite is true when we are not connected, that we deteriorate in absolutely every way. That's one of the reasons why it's so important for people to, to visit people at the hospital and, and, and be there with them while they're healing. Because one of the things that they say is that just being with someone, a loved one, you know, someone, a member of your family, by their bed at, in the hospital, encouraging them, talking to them, that is one of the things that helps in the healing process. It's one of the avenues of healing that God uses. And friends, we need to realize that we need to be as tenacious as these guys who are rebuilding the wall, we need to be as tenacious being connected in community. Because, see, they realized that they were in a battle. And you don't go into a battle alone. You go into a battle connected with other people. You know, in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, it talks a lot about don't forsake the gathering of yourselves. It talks a lot about being connected to the body of Christ, the church. And, in fact, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promises meaning God is faithful you know I was looking at that word unswervingly it's kind of an interesting word it, it actually means um, uh, not turning aside even for a moment not turning to the right or to the left right so I asked somebody this week I said hey um, how, how would you describe the word unswervingly and they said, um, the exact opposite to how you drive. Because I drive swervingly, right? I mean, it's, it's not good. You know, I, I, like I've actually, years ago, I was actually pulled over because I was driving swervingly. Nothing else was going on. But I, they're like, are you sure? And I'm like, I, I'm sure. I just drive this way. This is the way it is. You know those little divots on the side of the road, the, the, the rumble strips, right? You know, the ba 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 You get a little too far over, ba 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 You hit that? That is the soundtrack of my driving life, folks. Like, it's, I, it's, it's, it's from when I'm driving, it's rumble strips all the way. You know, it's just like, it's, it's very calming. It's very soothing. And now my wife's got one of those cars that does the lane assist. And so when it starts to go off, it like jerks the wheel back from you. Like, you can't handle this. I got to take over. But, but, you know, the rumble strips, it, 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 that image kind of came hit home for me. Because that's what community is all about. Because community is when you start to kind of get off the path, when you start to go your own way, when you start to get off of God's road for you, blah, 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 blah. when you begin to compromise your integrity, when you begin to justify your sin you, you know how we do because everybody else's sin is really horrible and awful but for some reason my sin is like you know I got a lot of good reasons you know when we start to do that when we start to hold bitterness and anger against somebody and we it just it just eats at us when we when we start to really just go off the path and start to isolate ourselves from other people blah, 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 blah. folks we are rumble strips for each other that's what we are that's what God has called us to be and we and honestly you can't do that in this room right because I can't just go up and say all right listen I noticed something about you I can't just walk up to you in the middle of worship and start doing that but you know what when we're connected in a class we're connected in a small group we really get to know each other and we're hanging out on the back porch talking I can say man I I just I want to encourage you in this area because I've been through what you've been through. I, I want to encourage you here. I want to encourage you to stay on the path. I want to encourage you to, to stay strong in what God has called you to do. I, I want to encourage you to keep going. We all need that sometimes, don't we? Don't we need that? See, you're not going to make it by yourself. You're not going to make it isolated. 
Not long ago, I talked to a guy who's really on fire for the Lord here at the church. He's, he's been connected. He's been really getting connected in and, and in, into the Word. And he told me, he said, he said, you know, I regret the seasons of my life where I wasn't as close to the Lord as I should have been. And I said, tell me more about that. And he says, well, it happened when I got disconnected and unplugged from other people. And all of us could probably have that same testimony, couldn't we? When we've the, when we are at our, been at our worst, oftentimes it's when we have been disconnected from others. When we've isolated ourselves from other people. And you know, I, I know the difference that community makes. Being in a group, being in a class together, being committed to one another. When you go through a divorce, it makes a difference if you're in a group or not. Because if you're not, a lot of times I've seen it happen where people just kind of go off the rails. But I've also seen it where people have encircled that person and cared about them and listened to them cry and listened to them talk and listened to them in a safe place be angry and, and helped get them through this thing in a healthy way. I've seen people who've lost loved ones, they've lost friends and family members and, you know, in, a, in a very short span of time, and they're just dealing with the, all kinds of loss, and I've seen those groups come around them, and, and, and it, you never ever really get over that, but you, they really help you get through it. And I've seen other people who, who've never been connected, don't get connected, and they go through something like that, and they just kind of go quiet. And they kind of become a, a shell of who they were. There's a reason why God put us together, folks. And so with every one of these tools, we've given you a do and action step, okay? So on February the 3rd, um, God willing and the COVID don't rise, okay? We are going to be uh, bringing back midweek and our midweek classes and underneath the uh, televisions out here in the lobby are sign-up sheets for different classes. And there are all kinds of things. And Kurt talked about that. And if you have any questions, Kurt's going to be out there and he can answer any questions about those particular classes. So there's small groups, there's men's groups, there's women's groups. There's an opportunity for you to get connected. And as I said before, you don't have to become a member to get connected. But my, my hope is that you will get connected here. That you will get into a group, that you'll find it, you'll, you'll test it out, try it out, and see what God does in your life and through the lives of others for you. Can we do that? Can we do that? I think, I think we can. That's my hope. Because the reality is, even though I said at the beginning you can't do life alone, that's not necessarily true. You can do life alone. It just stinks if you do and why would you want to when God has given us a ready-made opportunity right here to get connected so Kurt's gonna come up and, and pray for us and God bless you guys we love you and I hope you have an amazing week as Pastor Phil said if you'd like to get plugged into a small group or one of our midweek classes <clears throat> the signups are in the lobby under the TV monitors uh, there's a lot of different options for y'all throughout the week. We have a men's group that meets on Monday nights that Lee Smith and I um, co-lead together. We started it last May or June, just with six or seven guys on Zoom. And our last gathering we had before we took a break, we had over 70 men in it. And it's a great opportunity to get plugged in, meet some guys. We, it's at 8 p.m. on Monday night, so you can go home, have dinner, help your wife get the kids in bed, and then you can peel out <clears throat> and go to our men's group. And it lasts about an hour. And uh, we eat sometimes, and we always have a great time. This men's group, this kind of run, we're going to be studying through the book of James. So it'll be interesting to see that. It's a great book to study. And then on Wednesday nights, we have a lot of different groups. Lori LaBeouf is going to be leading a group on the Daniel plan. Um, Rob's teaching a group on the Apostle Paul. If you're curious to learn more about who Paul was, he wasn't one of the 12 disciples. A lot of people think that he was. But the Apostle Paul, he was an apostle. Um, his n former name was Saul, and he went through a, a very dramatic life change. Uh, what he did for a living before he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament was he persecuted Christians. He killed Christ followers. 
you want to learn more about Paul, jump into Rob's class. So there's a lot of opportunities for you to get plugged in, and we would love to see you. Men's group starts back a week from tomorrow. So February 1st, men's group starts back. If you're interested in any of that, talk to me in the lobby or shoot me an email if you're watching online, kurt at umt.org. And by the way, if you're watching online and you want to be registered to win the toolbox at the end of the series, let them know that in the comment section and we'll make sure we get you in the drawing. And by the way, this toolbox, our church did not go out and spend $900 on a toolbox. It was really cool. There's a guy in our church who has a hookup at Home Depot. He went and told them what we're doing. And they sold us this as a display model for $150. It's got a few dings and dents on it, but hey, it's a Craftsman toolbox for $150. And that's why we're going to bless somebody with it and give it away. Just turn in your uh, connect form at the white table in the lobby. There's a basket. Just drop that in there. Don't forget, we have Bibles on sale for $10 in the bookstore. And other than that, let me pray for you and you can get out of here because we have another service in 14 minutes. God, today, I thank you for our pastor's message. And God, we know that you didn't wire us up to do life alone. And God, as we read through scripture, we, we realize that no one ever did anything great for you in isolation, but they did it in community and with a team. So God, my prayer is this morning that for those who aren't into a community, those who don't have a network um, that they're in, that they can love and be loved by. For those who aren't in a group or a class to where the one and others in scripture can be fleshed out and lived, that you will open some doors and allow, allow them to be a part of that. Uh, God, I'm thankful for the communities that I get to be in and the friends that I've made since moving here and the people that I get to love and be loved by. So God, as we work as your church, the hands and feet of you, um, help us uh, always and continually grow towards you and closer to each other as we journey this thing called life. God bless the families that are represented here. Thank you so much for Jesus and what he did on the cross for us. And it's in your name we pray. And all the church said, all right, we'll see you next week.